So, and the subject, is, is, as it says here in the title, is that uh, this protein called PDIA6 is an attenuator, an inhibitor, of the unfolded protein response. And before I forget, I need to give credit to the people who did this work, particularly to the two, the brother and sisters shown here, who are both Italians, but they're not from the north, so I don't know if it's okay with you. Uh, um, I think this is Salerno, but I'm not, I'm not absolutely sure. Um, and uh, then Devin is a graduate student who is uh, also involved in the project. And Tali Gidelevich is a professor at uh, Drexel University, which is right next to our university. And we've collaborated. I'm not sure I'm going to get to her part in this uh, quite yet. So as Oscar mentioned, I've been interested in this uh, fascinating organelle uh, for the many, many, many years. Um, I'm actually not embarrassed to say that it's been 30 years. <laughs> um, and. Uh, this, I've been fascinated with this organelle because it does a lot of important things, not only uh, protein synthesis, but it's also the major calcium store of cells. This is uh, work that you're probably very familiar with. This is the site where uh, important metabolic pathways uh, and enzymes reside, like lipid uh, uh, metabolism, sugar metabolism. It's involved in detoxification uh, in some tissues, primarily the liver. Uh, and in signaling, okay? And for that reason, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of proteins that reside in the ER. We've worked mostly on molecular chaperones, but I'm not gonna touch that today. Um, it also has some cofactors, folding enzymes, transporters, and transducers, and this is kind of where our work is leading us. And, um, so if you consider that the ER is really a factory whose main purpose, one of its main purposes is to make secretory proteins, and in some cells, professional secretory cells, like antibody producing cells, this could be a dramatic workload. You, you may need to make Excuse 200. Me, I'm just looking for a pointer because you may need. I have a point. You have a point. You may need to make something like 200,000 molecules per, of, of a particular protein, say antibody molecules, per minute, which is equivalent to the tremendous rate in which a virus will hijack a cell and will make copies of itself. So it's tremendous workload in, in, in there. And therefore, sometimes you get to a point where the input of protein into the ER and the proteins that go into the ER are unfolded, right, overwhelms, it's much larger than the output of protein from the ER. And it's the, main, it's, it's, the, it's the folding capacity of the ER that's really important in regulating uh, whether the organelle can match the work necessary. And that's the purpose of the unfolded protein response. It's really an adaptive response, which is aimed at restoring the homeostasis of this Molecule. So whatever the set is, and it could be at a very low folding capacity in one cell, very high folding capacity in another cell, but you need to still restore the homeostasis when something perturbs, something interferes with the folding capacity. Okay? So in, so in many ways, I think that the, the name unfolded protein response is a misleading kind of a name. It doesn't necessarily just uh, result from accumulation of, of misfolded protein. Historically, this is how the unfolded protein or the ER stress response was discovered. But as I'll try to emphasize here, it's also a normal homeostatic part of a normal work of a cell. Okay. So the unfolded protein response is, uh, is, uh, um, uses three branches of signaling. Um, each of them starting from a different transmembrane uh, kinase, if you wish, or kinase-like molecule. One is called IRE1, inositol responsing enzyme 1, PERC, or ATF6. And again, if I'm telling you things that you don't know, please raise your hand and I'll explain more. Okay. Um, those, uh, we understand the consequences of activating each one of these pathways quite well from work uh, by many labs, primarily Peter Walter, David Ron, et cetera, et cetera. Um, IRE1 has one main function and some side functions. 
the main function is as a splicing, as a splicer of one particular message in the cell XBP, XBP1. When it splices XBP1, it and the, the product of that splice encodes a functional protein that can be a functional transcription factor, goes into the nucleus, sits on the appropriate promoters, and activate one of maybe 300 genes that participate in the response. And this is why this response is, is metabolic change in the whole cell. PERC, likewise, is also a kinase. One of its first, but it's not its, not its exclusive substrate, is elongation factor 2A. Okay. It involves in shutting down translation, ribosomal protein synthesis, but it does it very selectively. Okay. So many things shut down, some things don't. Some things, in fact, selectively are activated, like the transcription factor ATF4, which, again, goes to the nucleus, sits down on its appropriate uh, promoters and activated genes. ATF6 works in a completely different way. It, move, it doesn't act through phosphorylation. It's not a kinase. It doesn't phosphorylate or splice anything downstream. It just moves from the ER membrane to the Golgi membrane, where processing of the enzyme leads to formation of the active form, which again is a transcription factor. Quite often, when you, when experimentally, when people have um, applied ER stress to cells by using inhibitors of calcium, like topsigargine, inhibitor of glycosylation, like tunicomycin, all three of these branches, all three of these signaling pathways are activated simultaneously and work in parallel. Okay? But as I'll try to point out, it's not necessarily the case. It's not the way the machine is actually designed to work. Be it as it may, if we go back to these two, um, I, I'm not going to have anything more to say about the ATF6 branch. Everything else I'll have to say only deals with these two branches. Okay? And um, the way that these are proteins are thought to work is they are usually their native uh, resting state is a monomer in a plane of the membrane of the ER, where this is the lumen and this is the cytosol. And in that state, they are bound to the chaperone BIP, or GRP78. When the theory goes, when unfolded proteins accumulate in the lumen of the ER, they have higher affinity to BIP than either PERC or IRE1. They compete, essentially, with, the, with this binding, and therefore release the monomer from some inhibition, a conformational change is then transferred from the luminal domain to the kinase domain, that's the green part here, and then the protein can transphosphorylate, uh, autotransphosphorylate, much like tyrosine kinase receptors in the cell surface uh, autophosphorylate. Okay. The consequence of this autophosphorylation is activation of the last domain, the luminal domain, the brown domain here, which is the ribonucleus domain that does the, the splicing of the... Uh, um, um, of IRE1, of, of HAP, that's the splicing of XBP in the case of IRE1. Okay. But the important thing to realize here is that you get for transposphorylation, and at the same time you get dimerization. In fact, it was recently shown by Peter Walter's lab that it's not just dimerization, but a whole oligomerization in the plane of the membrane that is important for the activation. So this is kind of the classical model of, of the unfolding protein response. Here starts the, the, the exceptions and the, and the subtleties. Well, this is an experiment taken from a paper by Walter a few years ago in which they have applied persistent ER stress in the form of tunicobycin to cells that overexpress VCAM, very highly glycosylated protein. And you can see in the time course of up to 20, 20 hours that tunicomycin actually works, right? Because you have deglycosylated VCAM on this blot for the entire duration of the experiment. However, if you look for one output uh, of, of the, the signaling, yeah, in this case, phosphojunk, and I did not uh, mention it before, but this also is initiated by IRE1 signaling. It's a more minor activity, if you will, of IRE1. 
phosphogenic phosphorylation only is visible in the first few hours and then it subsides. Right? So even though at 16 hours and 20 hours you have the chemical stress still present, right? phosphogenic um, activation is already down. Even more surprisingly, if you look here at the splicing of, of, of uh, XBP1, the splicing is also transient. It goes down after a maximum at four hours. So the nature of the signaling is transient even if the stress remains. For me, this was a difficult thing to at first uh, understand and to think about. Um, but it, nonetheless, it indicated that the, the, you don't need to continually signal all the time. And just like in many other receptor systems, there is an attenuation of the signaling. Okay? Signaling is only necessary to initiate something and can then be attenuated, can then be uh, shut down. The same thing holds for, as you'll see uh, later on, not just for IRE1, but also signaling through the PERC kinase. Okay? So it leads to the question of what does attenuate UPR signaling? Yeah. There are several molecules that are known to interact with them on the cytosolic side. There are phosphatases that can take off the phosphate. There are other chaperones, cytosolic chaperone that can bind to, this, to the cytosolic domain of this protein. But the only molecule that's known to interact with the luminal domain in the lumen of the ER is BIP. And that's important because it's in the lumen that the perturbation happens. It's in the lumen where the workload is, uh, is modulated. Is it an increase or decrease? So these molecules need to somehow sense what's going on in the lumen of the ER. And other than, the, other than BIP, none, no, no other uh, molecule was known that could attenuate the signaling. And so what I'd propose here today, based on the data you'll see in a minute, is that a molecule called PDIA6, protein disulfide isomerase A6, is the attenuator. And it belongs to the general family of PDIs, of which there must be 17 or 20 uh, different um, um, and similar enzyme in the ER, that usually we associate with shuffling disulfide bonds, taking non-native disulfide that form, say, as errors of uh, during the folding process, breaking them and, and reshuffling them to the right one so that the normal native conformation of the protein could be established instead of the mistaken. Uh, and these PDIs usually, but not exclusively, use a thyroidoxin motif. It's a domain that I show here as a, as a yellow block. Okay? That has, a, uh, as an active site, the tetrapeptide cysteine, two amino acids and another cysteine. Usually it's glycine and histidine uh, in between. That's the canonical one. PDI6 has two of them with, with the canonical sequences. Okay. As I say, it's one of 17 or so uh, similar PDIs in the ER with these kind of motifs, okay, which will be one of the problems that I'm not going to solve for you, but, but you should, one should think about. How do we know that it, how do we get an indication that it involves in, in signaling. So first, we got into it because we did, for a different purpose, we depleted cells of PDIA6 using shRNA. And you can see here that the depletion is very efficient. Okay. When you do a Western on the cell and blot with, anti, uh, with antibodies to various chaperones, here it's anti cadil you can see that when you don't apply any exogenous stress to the cell, you have unchanged level of BIP, uh, this molecule, which we're not sure what it is, or a GRP94, luminal major ER protein levels unchanged between the control depleted and PDIA6 depleted cells. So normally this shutdown, this silencing didn't have an effect. But if you applied mild exogenous stress in the form of 0.1 microgram per ml tunicomycin, that's not, too, that's not a lot. Okay. Now you all of a sudden see that there is augmented expression of BIP, augmented expression of GRP94, augmented expression of several other proteins that I'm not showing you here. And when we quantify this extent of, of upregulation of expression, 
we can get this graph. So this is the amount of um, uh, upregulation of, say, normalized BIP expression as, as you treat with more and more tunicomycin, or as you treat with, also works with uh, increasing time in tunicomycin. In cells that have PDIA6, this is the amount in cells that don't have PDIA6. So we removed something. The removal of this enzyme enables upregulation of the response. We can show that this is actually the cause and not a secondary effect because we can eliminate this upregulation by putting back PDIA6 into the cells. Right? For that, we need to make PDIA6 cDNA, which is resistant to RNAi. We did that. Okay. Put it into RNAi deficient cell. And you can see, let's just focus on the, on, on the graph for the normalized BIP expression, that without stress, there's no, no effect. With some stress, there is a large um, uh, upregulation of BIP compared to the control cells when you don't have PDI, no, no PDI plus PDI. If you put back PDI into the cells that are resistant, you eliminate that delta. Okay. So it's co sort of complementation experiment. So now we looked at what does it do to the actual signaling. And as you can see here in, the, in this time course, and again, if you, this, is the, this is one of the examples of the gels, which we quantify here. So we looked here at the spliced versus unspliced XPP1. And again, the, the dark bars are with cells that don't have PDIA6. The white bars do have PDIA6. You can see that the splicing initiates equally, roughly equally well, but without PDIA6, it persists. Look at this delta, look at this delta for longer, longer time. You can also show it if you give it a pulse of DTT and then wash the DTT, remove the stress, and then again quantify the splicing of XBP as a function of time at four hours, eight hours, 24 hours. And again, you see that there is persistent presence, continuation of splicing of XBP1 in the cells without PDIA6 as compared to cells that have it. Like we removed something. It doesn't, the effect of PDIA6 is not limited to IRE1 branch of the pathway. It's also seen with the PERC pathway as assayed here by phosphorylation of EIF to alpha. Again, you can see more persistence, in this case also higher amplitude of phosphorylation in this branch. So both of br those branches of, of UPR employ PDIA6 and employ it as an inhibitor, as an attenuator. So the model that we've come up with, and I'll try to, in the rest of the talk, try to uh, highlight the evidence for some of them, uh, is as follows. IRE1 and PERC exist as a monomer bound to BIP. Something causes the release of BIP from it and allows oligomerization, first dimerization, then oligomerization of, the, um, of this molecule. So this is the active state. The active state is an active kinase, shown here by the Ps. And we propose that this is the state to which PDIA6 binds. Okay. I put here disulfide bonds because I'll, I'll show you some data uh, relevant for this. Okay. And by binding to the active state of PDIA6, somehow it returns it to the monomeric state, the less active state, and attenuates the reaction, and perhaps enables BIP to come back. So you close the cycle. We know separately, and actually this is one of the things that had been known about PDIA6 before we even touched the molecule, that PDIA6 can bind to BIP, and it can work with BIP unfolding of various BIP clients. Okay? We do not have any evidence that this, this population of PDIA6 that binds to BIP is related to the population of PDIA6 that binds to IRE1. So we propose that there are uh, distinct molecules. Okay? And the final element that this model shows is that even if you don't have PDIA6, you can still shut down a response. You can still go from the activated uh, response to the monomeric state inactive response by some other mechanism. And why do I say that? Because I showed you that even without PDIA6, there is still 
decline in the response, right? So it doesn't stay up here. So there must be something else that enables the response to attenuate, but on a different time scale. Okay. So question number one for us was, we showed that PDI-6 modulates the extent and the duration of the response when you apply the chemical stress on, on, on the cells. What about non-experimental, the more physiological UPR? Okay. And the distinction, I, I think, is an interesting and, and worthwhile distinction to think about. Experimental UPR is usually induced by TTT, dudicomycin, topsigargine. Okay. And because of our convenience as researchers, usually is induced at very high concentration. I like to call it the sledgehammer. You take a big hammer and you hit the cells. Okay? The cells, in fact, die rather rapidly. Okay? Um, and consequently, this increased, uh, this, this concentrated uh, application of stress leads to apoptosis of the cells. But there are many cases that are really interesting of physiological um, employment of this signaling pathway. For example, in beta cells, response, normal response to glucose level. So I just had lunch. My you know, glucose level is up. My pancreas wants to make insulin. I'm having an a, a induction of this pathway in my pancreas. Okay? And I'll show you uh, some of our, something about it a, a bit later. So it's not just induced by chemical. Secondly, it's induced by, in general, variable uh, levels of stress, usually much lower than the sledgehammers that we apply using the chemicals. And then the aim of this type of, of response is not to kill the cells. Usually they don't die. Uh, your beta cells need to go back down to the normal level to be able to respond to the next meal. Okay, you don't want to kill them. So this is a homeostatic response rather than an apoptotic response. And examples for this are uh, not just the glucose stimulator insulin secretion by beta cells, but those of you who work on differentiation of uh, plasma cells know very well that this signaling pathway is actually re responsible for the ability of cells to go from a resting B cell to a high level production of antibodies. And there are other examples that I, that I list here for, for normal physiological UPR. Okay. Interestingly, those physiological UPR uh, conditions don't necessarily employ all those uh, parallel branches. Right? So for example, in the case of B-cell differentiation, if you uh, create a, a null mutant for IRE1 or for XBP, the B cells cannot differentiate into plasma producing cells. You have a mouse that doesn't have an antibody compartment, right? But the B cells doesn't really care about the PERC uh, branch of the pathway. Conversely, in the case of some other cells, uh, um, like uh, thyrocytes, it's the PERC and ATF6 pathways which are essential. The IRE XBP branch of the pathway is less essential. So there's not only a, a different purpose of it, but there's a different sort of uh, integration of how the signaling is generated in the pathway. Okay. Here's an example, not from our work, of a UP, physiological UPR in beta cells. In low glucose concentration, PERC is very highly activated, as you can see here by the phosphorylation of EF to alpha. Okay. At higher glucose, it's much less activated. So if you plot it, it responds, PERC is activated in, in zero glucose much, much more than in 20 millimolar glucose. The normal glucose level is around here, between 5 and 10 is, is the normal fluctuation. Okay. Um, um, IRE1 in uh, beta cell is also regulated, but it's regulated in the other direction. It actually uh, responds much, much better to higher glucose then to lower glucose. So the PERC and the IRE1 respond to glucose in actually yin-yang type uh, um, uh, fashion. You know? And what the relationship between them in any given glucose concentration is actually not very well worked out. Okay. Um, 
So we wanted to ask what happens if we delete PDIA6 not just from your normal fibroblast or from 293T cells, but from insulin producing cells. Okay? And that's what I'm showing you here. Depletion of PDIA6 from insulin producing beta cells. These are ins one cells. And as we saw in the fibroblast before, when we assay phosphorylation of EF2 alpha, so this is the readout for PERC signaling, you see much more robust and much more prolonged signaling in the absence of PDIA6 compared to control RNAi. Um, this can also be shown in, 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 in the Western here. Uh, and I'm making the, the distinction here because I'm trying to show you in normal cells that are shifted for one hour to 20 millimolar glucose and then either kept there for one more hour or shifted down to zero millimolar glucose to sort of simulate the, the changes in glucose level that one gets normally in the body. Okay. So within one hour, you can already see at zero, zero low glucose phosphorylation and the phosphorylation is much stronger in the absence of PDIA6 than it is in the presence of PDIA6. At 20 millimolar, there's very mild phosphorylation, and it's not affected by the presence of PDI6. So again, it's a modulator. It doesn't allow the signaling. It controls how much signaling one gets okay. in insulin-producing cells. Okay. And this is quantified here. Okay. Um, and and I, I'm made that comment to myself not to, to emphasize the point that since we're assaying it over one hour, okay, we must be dealing with the signaling. We, there's not enough time to synthesize molecule, transcription, translation, all the other uh, uh, processes to come into effect. Okay. okay. Um, when, when, when you ask, so, so this is an, uh, another important experiment since the purpose of these cells is to secrete insulin. And insulin is secreted by um, uh, a different glucose level, right, by ch in changing the glucose level. What we, measure, what we plot here is not the secretion of insulin, but how much more insulin is secreted at you know, in, in, in when, when you gl give glucose to the cells as opposed to the resting state of the cell. So let's say at 10 millimolar glucose, how much more insulin is secreted compared to the normal level? It's about twofold in this experiment. In some experiments, it's fivefold. Yeah. And again, in the, in the absence of PDIA6, and I, I'm missing this uh, notation from the slide, you do not get any stimulation, glucose stimulation of insulin secretion that you normally get. Normally, at zero, you don't get any insulin secretion. As you increase insulin, you get stimulation. Stimulation is maximal at 10 or 25. This is transient hyperglycemia after a meal. You get glucose stimulation. Okay? PDIA6 is necessary for that as well. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to uh, skip that because I don't know if I'm going to get to it. But that slide showed that both IRE1 and PERC signaling are modulated by PDIA6 in beta cells. And that's true in the context of both physiological UPR, modulation by glucose. It's also true in the, the slide that I skipped in the context of UPR induced by the presence of misfolded insulin. The presence of misfolded insulin is actually something that's very important for diabetes of the young. There's a congenital uh, types of diabetes where, that arise because the babies are born with misfolded insulin okay, so due to some somatic mutation. Inherited, inherited mutation, sorry, not somatic mutation. Um, and the beta cells are always under stress in these, in these kids. Okay. It's not a huge fraction of diabetic a patient, but it's a considerable fraction, and our colleague in the University of Chicago were particularly interested in that, and that's why we measured uh, the effect of PDIA6 on in in that case. Okay, I'm also going to skip that in the interest of time. The purpose of these slides that I'm skipping is to show you a completely different model is is to mention a completely different model of physiological UPR, and to make the point that we don't have 
a mouse that is missing PDIO6. It doesn't exist. We'd love to make it, and if you hear of one, please call me. But we do have an animal model, albeit an invertebrate, the worm. And in the worm, it's known that the developmental cycle of the worm does depend on the UPR pathway. If you have a muta mutations in the UPR signaling pathway, any of the players that I mentioned, you have a, a developmental uh, uh, arrest. Okay? So you have to trust me, but we have aligned, we've looked at in the genome of C. elegans for all the PDI uh, genes in, in the animals, and there were three that were known in the database called very imaginatively PDI1, 2, and 3. And none of them was particularly related, aligned particularly well with the mammalian PDIA6. But an unknown uh, okay, for a reading frame called TAG320, TAG means temporary assigned gene that nobody has any function for, number 320, aligned much, much better with the mouse PDIA6 as you see here in the evolutionary tree than any of the other ones. Okay? And there is a deletion in that one, we deleted it, and we discovered it's, it causes developmental defect, uh, developmental arrest of larvae. Instead of getting uh, from a segregation from a heterozygote of 75%, we get much lower segregation, and we can show that the homozygous deleted worms are in fact unable to develop past the first larval stage. Just believe me. That, that. So, this part, I'll summarize this part of the talk by saying that I showed you and I mentioned to you some evidence that PDI6 attenuates both UPR in response to accumulation of misfolded protein and physiological UPR in response to glucose tension and in larval development of C. elegans. So, it's not just a tool to look at tunicomycin, topsigargine, and DTT. Okay. So the other question I would like to say, how does PDI6 modulate uh, PERC and IRE1? Okay. So if PDI works enzymatically, given that it has uh, these thyroidoxin domains and the CXXC motifs, here's what it should do. It, the enzyme should bind to its substrate, so in our case, the substrate will be IRE1. It should detect some unoxidized cysteine in IRE1. Okay. And the enzyme should transfer its own disulfide right, to IRE1. And through some kind of a enzymatic, a kinetic intermediate, there will be a mixed disulfide. Right. The usual, so the, sorry, the usual trick is if you take the enzyme and mutate one of the cysteines okay, and only leave one of the two cysteines in there, it would actually trap mixed disulfide with anything it can possibly bind to, okay, but it cannot resolve the, the mixed disulfide. It remains bound. It remains bound, right. covalently bound. Okay? You can see it very easily on non-reducing gels, right? because it's a covalent interaction. And you should see a new band, the sum of the enzyme, which is 50K, plus whatever substrate. In our case, IRE, is about 110 or, or so. So we should see another, a, a, a new band. Okay. So here's a, a, the experiment. Okay. We've taken, uh, I'll take you through it slowly. Yeah. So we've taken PDIA6 that's labeled with V5, which Oscar tells me is actually SV5. That's the, 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 the original label. Yeah. 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 And uh, we transfected it into cells. Or the control is cells transfected with ER form of GFP. Okay? So you can see the level of, of expression. Okay? We transfected it with the wild type PDIA6. P5 is another name for PDIA6. Uh, I apologize for the confusion, but I don't take credit for it. It's in, it, 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 I, I, didn't, I didn't give it two names. Um, so. Um, uh, PDI, Walter PDI6, or with one of those trap mutants where we mutated a single cysteine but allowed the other one to work. Okay? Or, alternatively, we mutated all the cysteines, so now we have a, an enzyme, a PDI, without any cysteine in it. Okay? So I think you'll appreciate that first, the lane that contained the trap P5 
PDIA6 contains a lot more bands, including a dimer of the 50 plus 50 here. Okay? Plus it contains this new band here. Okay? The appearance of this new band here, which you can see a very mild band in, in the wild type, is completely it completely disappears when you lose when you deal with a mutant that doesn't have any cysteines. So it depends on cysteines in PDI A6. Right? It's enhanced when you mutate one of them and not the other. Okay? And what you see here using the two color uh, capability of our detection system, okay, that new band actually stains yellow here, which is a combination of the antibody to IRE1 and the antibody to PDIA6. They both tag one with HA, one with V5. Combination of them give you, gives you uh, uh, a yellow band, right? So at least this one is the right molecular weight for a mixed disulfide that contains both. The other bands, uh, of course, including at the top of the gel. So this is one of our evidences for PDI6 forming a mixed disulfide with, uh, with IRE1. Um, we, I told you before that, that PDI6 binds BIP, binds BIP non-covalently, and you can see it here. By the absence, uh, this is the same type of experiment where we are saying for a common band that includes both BIP and IRE1, okay? and you don't see any yellow band. Right. You only see bands that contain one or contain the other on a total non-reducing gel. Okay? So even though the two bind and you can co-IP them, the binding is different. The binding to BIP is different than the binding to IRE1. And in fact, if you deplete BIP uh, from, from uh, these cells, you still have binding of uh, PDI6 to IRE1. So this is shown here. This is, this is the input. This is the immunoprecipitate using the tag to, to, uh, to PDI6. Right? And you see that you have binding to IRE1 in the blot here, even under conditions where BIP is depleted. I should say that this experiment suffers from the um, weakness that you cannot deplete BIP as efficiently and as cleanly as you can deplete other proteins. BIP is a really essential protein, and even short time frame, the cells that are depleted very well die. They don't, don't get it to the, to the gel. So this is the best we can do, and therefore it's not a, a, as strong an experiment as, as it could be done. But it's in the right direction, I hope. At least that's how I, I see it. I'd like to hear from you. So even if we do deplete BIP, you still get IRA1 associated uh, uh, with, the, with PDIA6. So this is why I uncouple those, those two. So that's the basis for saying that this population of molecules and this population of molecules in our hands seem to be quite distinct. Okay. And, and, and it's also the reason for diagramming the PDIA6 IRA1 interaction as a covalent disulfide intermediate interaction here. Okay. So if you buy it so far, if I sold you a piece of goods so far, then where does it bind on IRE1? And this is the data that we've just gotten in the last few weeks. For these experiments, what we use is a reporter assay, which is quite satisfying to use. Okay. We took a fluorescent protein here. We took a red fluorescent protein, tom tomato, monomeric tomato. And we engineered it so that its expression is dependent on the splicing of XBP1. And to remind you, the splicing of XBP1 can only be performed by IRE1. And the way it's engineered is if it's not spliced, if XBP1 is not spliced, there is a stop cassette here that does not allow expression of the fluorescent protein. Only when you splice and remove this intron, you remove the stop cassette and now you get an in-frame fusion fluorescent protein, so you get red cells. Okay. So if those of you who can see, there's a huge lot of cells, untransfected cells. Only some of them are fluorescent here, okay. but there's clear fluorescent, and the fluorescent is uh, concentrated in the nuclei, as you would expect. Okay. So we use this assay. Uh, to, to us, simply by counting the red cells per field in different conditions, uh, to convince ourselves that this really behaves properly, so we, so we can 
utilize it to analyze PDI6 effectively. Okay. So for example, if you increase concentrations of tunicomycin on these cells, this is only in a three hour time frame, you see more and more and more red, red cells reported firing in the cell, as you expect. If you overexpress IRE1 from a very strong promoter, okay, you get tremendous increase in report of firing in the cells. If you express a mutation that's known to poison the kinase activity, K907A, this is from the work of the Peter Walter lab, you poison the ability of the reporter to work. You go from here to here. And interestingly, even if you express this, this mutant, so this mutant in the presence of tunicomycin, which otherwise, for example, in this condition, will give you 21 cells per field, right? you abolish the firing of amoy. So it acts as a dominant negative. Okay? And that's relevant if you think about the fact that these molecules actually oligomerize. They form oligomers, right? So the presence of the 907 mutant okay, enables to poison even the wild type uh, IRE that exists, endogenous IRE that exists in these cells. These are just 293 cells. These are not knockout cells. I hope I explained it. Okay. So the interpretation of this experiment is that if you have a mutation that, that disables the, the uh, activity here, right, you disable the splicing activity of this domain and you get no red cells, no firing of the report. Good. So now we looked and asked, if we are right, and there's a mixed disulfide and it binds to IRE in a covalent fashion, where could it possibly bind? So we aligned the luminal domains of PERC and IRE1, and which is which is, doesn't really matter here, just be impressed with the fact that there's pretty good alignment between the yeast IRE1, the mammalian IRE1, and the mammalian PERC, as shown in this crystal structures here, which were published some years ago. And there are cysteines in the sequence. Unfortunately, the cysteines are not in the crystal structure at all. There are three cysteines. They're in three corners of the structure. They the obviously are too, um, uh, too um, um, mobile to actually crystallize in any one particular configuration. So there's cysteine in this loop over here, 109. Okay. There's cysteine in this corner here, 148. And there's cysteine in this corner here, 332. So these are the three candidates that unfortunately we don't have the precise atomic structure for, but we know roughly where they would be in the, in, in, in the structure. Okay. So we made the appropriate mutants. We made the appropriate mutants in IRE1, mutating cysteine 148, the cysteine 332, etc., etc. And we express uh, these mutants of IRE1 in HA tag form and uh, immunoprecipitated from the cells and ask, does PDI6 come down with these, with these mutants? Okay. And you can see that the association with cysteine 148S is much diminished, but not the association with cysteine 332S is not so affected. Okay. We have some, uh, some other experiments. The, the, the consistent finding is always that if you mutate cysteine 148, you abolish the association between the PDIA6 and IRE1, or at least you diminish it very, very dramatically. Okay? I should emphasize that this is done with the trap form of PDIA6 that should form, that should stabilize the, the mixed disulfide. Okay? So we don't see it. Okay? Again, this band disappears if we use the cysteine free, the cysless form of PDIA6. We don't see. IRE1 co-immunoprecipitation. So then we plug that into our, uh, our reporter assay and again uh, plot that. And you would expect that if PDIA6 is actually binding to uh, IRE1 and working the way I try to tell you it works, it shouldn't abolish the firing of the reporter. Because you remember, it doesn't prevent the splicing, it actually what it does, it, it exacerbates the splicing. It makes it longer lived splicing. Okay. We don't have the time dimension in the reporter assay, but as you can see, 
Expression of wild type IRE1 in the cells leads to this much reporter firing. Expression of the cysteine 148 mutant actually gives us slightly more. Okay. So this is the one that we didn't see any co-IP with, with PDI6. And expression of the cysteine 332 also didn't kill the ability of, of uh, IRE1 to fire. But the difference between them is here we cannot see any co-IP with, with PDI6. Here we do. Right. Um, so, uh, so, so the mutations of these cysteines still allow the reporter to be active. We're not dealing with a misfolded, a dysfunctional uh, IRE1, but one that does not, uh, does not bind um, um, the, the attenuator. So a uh, tentative conclusion so far is that PDI6 binds via a mixed disulfide with cysteine 48. Maybe there's a population that also binds with cysteine 332. Um, and we'll need to more experiments to uh, establish that point, uh, that point. Which leads me to a completely fantastic hypothesis, given that there are crystal structures of the luminal domain, and given that IRE1 and PERC dimerize in oligomerase. If you schematically look at this structure as a triangular structure, uh, as, as shown here, okay. the, one of the crystal forms, which may or may not be physiological, is inverted association of the two dimers as diagrammed here. Okay, So this beta sheet here is actually aligns itself with this beta sheet here. And you actually can form a continual beta sheet, a much larger beta sheet across this, okay, which those of you who work on MHC molecules will recognize very nicely as a potential peptide binding uh, surface. Again, this is hypothesis, not, not experimental observation. But if you do that, okay, and cysteine 148 will be here and here, okay, you can kind of uh, amateurishly try to dock PDI, the two PDI6 uh, uh, thyroidoxine domains okay, and, and get a mental picture of how it could possibly interact with the dimer. Remember I told you that it, the, our, our, our data and our hypothesis therefore is that it doesn't interact with the monomer of IRE1 but only with, the, with, with the, it interacts with the dimer. So potentially something about this dimerization creates a better binding surface for PDI6 to come in and dock with the dimer or oligomer of, of IRE1. Okay. There is no structure of PDI6, so I'm limited to doing the docking in a very amateurish way. I can't do it in a systematic, uh, reasonable, crystallographically reasonable way. Right. So the... The next question is, of course, since PDI6 affects both IRE1 and PERC, and since the structures are similar, how does it modulate PERC signaling? Where does it bind? We don't know. We don't know if it binds physically to PERC. We don't know if it forms a mixed disulfide with PERC. And we certainly don't know which residues of PERC are, are, are important for the binding. So that's still to, to be determined. Okay. Um, so I think I lost my last uh, I had a model slide here, but I'll come back to it here. Just to, to conclude what I told you. Uh, so this is kind of our, our, our model for a, a novel attenuator. This is, as far as we know, a new um, molecule, a new participant in the signaling that participates in the signaling from the luminal side of the ER where it can actually sense the conditions that exist in the lumen and based on that can bind to the activated forms of IRE1 and PERC. And doing so, it can shut down the signaling. If you remove this molecule, now you have more prolonged signaling, more sustained signaling. And to remind you, the more prolonged signaling is pro-apoptotic. The, the, the more transient signaling is homeostasis as return back to the normal state. And we show that the activity is dependent on the enzymatic activity of this molecule, dependent on the cysteines of this molecule, the thyroidoxic domain of this molecule. And at least in the case of IRE1, we have the beginning of a target to which it binds that, that makes sense structurally 
and, and physiologically, that's cysteine 148. Um, and presumably the purpose of this interaction is to not allow the unfolded protein response from overshooting, from going to be too excessive and eventually lead to activation of an apoptotic pathway, but to turn it down in, 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 reason, in reasonable time, in re biologically reasonable time frame. So now I'll go to my acknowledgement slide. Uh, again, this all, almost all this work was done by uh, David Eletto and Daniela Eletto from Devon. Uh, I didn't talk about the C. elegans work, which was a collaboration with uh, uh, Tali Gidalevich, but I wanted to point out that we are working on an animal model of, of, uh, of this, albeit uh, a, an invertebrate model. And I'd like to thank all the collaborators that gave us various reagents, funny agencies, and you for your attention. And please ask me hard questions. Mm -hmm.